We welcome Kyle to the show. How are you doing today, Kyle? I'm great, Keith. Thanks for having me on your show. I appreciate it. It's good to have you on this end of the 2023 season, as we see what happens in 2024. It should be an interesting year. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> not, Hopefully, not any more good. interesting. Not any more interesting than this year, because this year was real interesting. Let's mellow it out a little bit, at least for me. I, I would love to. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I love to ask my guests a question to kind of get to know you better. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Best piece of advice I've ever received. You know, the short answer is make friends and make a lot of them business wise, personally, just make a ton of friends because that's what matters in life. At least to me, that's what matters in life. And when you surround yourself with the right people, you know, a lot of people say the, the five people represent who you are, that kind of thing. But Regardless, if, if I need help or if I want to help someone or if I'm in a bad place or I'm in a great place, I want someone to talk to, uh, to connect with, especially men in my life. So that was that was really good. A good tip, a life changing tip for sure. It makes sense. I mean, more people you surround yourself with, the easier. I always say the easier to spread the burden out among friends for, yeah. <laughs> versus, yes. versus carrying it out on your own. <laughs> Yeah, it's like those, you know, those people pyramids where there's like 30 people on the bottom and there's like 500 on the top. It's it's amazing what happens when you can spread the weight out, you know. Yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> love it. I'm always curious of people like yourself who've achieved great things in life. Um, who are some people who serve to inspire you or even be a mentor to you on your journey? Yeah, I would say first was my dad. So my dad's an entrepreneur. He actually just sold his business. Uh, he runs a he ran with his with my uncle a uh, orange packing business, and so they recently were bought out by another business that's kind of local. And he started that when in 1983, I believe. Yeah, 1983 with my grandpa. And my sister was three and I was zero years old. And so to start something at that age with like hardly any money in your pocket and to just go after it. And there's so much dependence on how the weather goes and whatever God decides to do for that year. It's really inspiring to me. And plus he was always, you know, always been in my life and available to me for whatever I needed, especially as I've gotten older, there's been a deeper connection. So him first and then second growing up or not growing up, but growing up in my, um, adulthood as a guy by, by the name of Jack that I worked with for about 10 years, nine years at a men's mentoring program. And so he was instrumental in kind of my growth from separating from my parents to finding a mentor in my life as I became an adult. So those, those two gentlemen were fundamental for me. Yeah. Those people are always special to kind of be able to stop and thank, thank God for those people and how they impacted the journey that we're on. Yeah, exactly. And, and <laughs> Jack was was one of those guys that didn't mince words, and my my dad's pretty nice, and he's he's he he'll tell it straight, but he's pretty nice about it. Where Jack is just like in your face, and <laughs> and I needed that, you know, I needed both, especially from men, you know, I needed right. both because because I had my mom who was kind of a softy, and so needing both of those angles was was important. And in retrospect, I only realized it that how powerful it was to have both of those in my life. Yeah, true. Very true. I love to have people tell their story. So you want to share with us your personal journey? Yeah. Uh, so born and raised in a little town called Dinuba, Washington. It looks like Danuba, but it's Dinuba, not Washington, excuse me, Dinuba, California. I'm in Washington now. And uh, or <laughs> Orange Farm until I was 18 and then moved off to uh, a small, another small town called San Luis Obispo and went to college there for four years, lived there a total of 12 years. And after college, I worked for a men's mentoring program where I helped guys that are 18 and 25 who are stuck and off track in life. Typically some sort of kind of broken home, abuse, drug or alcohol struggles, that kind of thing. So I lived there for a year and then worked in the program another eight plus years in various roles. And I cut my teeth in the business world in that role, ironically, because you wouldn't think a men's mentoring program would give you that opportunity, but we were self-sustained. So I got my work ethic from the farmer up farming upbringing, but then I got my business acumen from the self-sustained part of the nonprofit. We ran a pet resort that housed a hundred plus dogs a night and then 50 plus dogs a day. And so I got the opportunity to grow that business. And then I ran the nonprofit for three years after I grew the um, pet resort. And then off into HR once I moved up to Washington with my family and uh, got into disc assessments 
did a, <laughs> I did an assessment workshop for a petroleum engineering company and it was a disaster. I, I, I remember sitting in the boardroom meeting with the admin lady, two v, a VP, and then two like sales director guys. And then there was another guy on the phone in Alaska, another guy on the phone in Arizona, another guy on the phone down the hall because he was sick, so he couldn't be in the room. So imagine trying to lead a workshop where three people are on the phone and and you've got different levels and positions and you're just you're trying to lead this workshop. Well, long story short, I'm covered in sweat within five minutes of the interview and I I barely survived it because finally the admin spoke up and then we spent the next hour kind of limping through the workshop and I left and the VP said, Hey, good job. And I'm like, BS. But you know, anyway, I hop in my car and I'm like, this was a really, really crappy experience and I loved it. And so that workshop and some of the coaching I had done prior to the workshop just went, this is it. This is what I want to do. And so from there ultimately came blue shirt coaching. So that's the short version of my journey. So how did, from the worst experience in your life, give you the idea that I want to do this more? I'm just curious. Well, the thing is, I the people that I was working with to do the one-to-one -one coaching prior to the workshop, they had a great experience with me. And I felt like I was really helpful to them. And I was told that I was really helpful to them. And even though the, the workshop was a dumpster fire, I knew that they got something out of it anyway. And if I could do a great job or even just a good job, then people would be getting really good value and benefit from my work. And from then I knew it was just up. There was, there was no down. It was just up for me. And it was true. It's been true. So that's cool. I'm just curious because people are hearing that going, how did that inspire you to say, this is what I want to do more? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what did you learn on your journey? I mean, I know that that one moment helped you to kind of crystallize in your mind. This is what I want to do. What other lessons did you learn on this journey that helped you get where you are today? You know, I think one of the biggest ones is having a mission and sticking with it. I was, uh, let's see, it's probably a, may, roughly a year into my business and I was kind of floundering in terms of who to work with and what's the intention behind what I'm doing and how, how do I go about doing it? And I remember driving home from, from a networking event, I think it was, and I was on the, on this road, it was about 15 minutes until I was going to be home. And I was listening to the book by Jim Quick called, um, what is it? Un Limitless. And in there, he talks about having a vision. And I had been working on a mission slash vision for, for months at that time. And, and I was praying about it, journaling about it, thinking about it, asking people about it, but nothing was coming. I was getting really, really frustrated. And so I turned off the, the audio and I, and I just prayed. I said, God, what's the vision you have for my business? And I waited. And it took like five seconds because I'd been waiting for a long time, but this was the moment for me. And God said, I want you to help thousands of business owners shift their mindsets and habits so I can transform their hearts. And I went, okay, and then cried. <laughs> because even if someone isn't a believer, someone doesn't believe in God or whatever, there's still transformation that matters and still really important. And I knew that this was a universal mission for me and for the people that I get to, to coach. And that was one of those life shifting and business shifting moments for me. Uh, and there's a lot of other lessons, but that was kind of a, a big catalytic moment for me. You would probably say that that mission is what drives you every day, I'm guessing. Yes, 100%. Yeah. And, and more so, the longer I'm in business, the more I see that that really is what's been driving me. I've kind of tried to deny it <laughs> or something. I don't know what I was doing, but this year has made that very clear that I'm not here to, to help you like, yes, I want your business to grow. Yes, I want you to make more money. Yes, I want you to be uh, have all those things. But more importantly, I want to help the individual transform who they are, become the best version of themselves. And recently I've had two, three, wow, yeah, three clients where I've done some deep dives. I do a deep dive, which is two roughly four hour sessions with people where, the, where ultimately their bigger problem was they're afraid to be the best version of themselves. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that's why people don't transform. They're afraid to be a better version of themselves because it's scary. It's You're in a rut. You're used to who you are. And I am too in certain areas. I'm used to it and I don't want to shift. And so when I dive in with them and I and three of the five I've worked with in this that deep of a capacity, 
that's what their thing is. I'm like, wow, this is a bigger deal. You know, 60% of the people so far, that's been their thing. And I'm like, okay, this mission is very clear. Like this is the work for me to be doing. And if you transform your life and who you are and how you see yourself, your business is going to grow, period. It's just going to happen. And so that's, that's why I love what I'm doing so much is it all just ties together so perfectly. Well, let's dive in a little bit deeper to what the blue shirt framework is, because I think that'll help us to kind of help you help our audience figure out how do you help people figure out the best version of themselves from your blue shirt framework. So explain that to us. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, leadership has a cycle to it. And I spent a lot of time at the very beginning of my business studying, you know, books and people and reading things and watching videos and then studying my own clients. And one morning it was, it was uh, 3 a.m. in the morning and I woke up and I had been working on an acronym. I love acronyms. And I've been working on an acronym for what my leadership framework was going to be, my own intellectual property that I could do whatever I wanted to with. And I heard, I heard the words self-awareness or the word self-awareness. And that's not that mind shattering or groundbreaking or anything. People have heard that word before, but for me, it brought everything together. And so I jumped out of bed, ran into the kitchen while my kids were sleeping and sat at the kitchen table and I went, okay, what is, where does this take me? And for the next three hours, I went from self-awareness to then going to this blue framework, which is to be a self-aware leader lead with accountability, use a growth mindset and empower others. And ultimately that is the cycle of, of leadership. We become more aware of ourselves and who we are and our limitations or strengths. And then we use accountability to stick with those things and to grow and to increase our abilities. And if you put those two together, of course, growth is going to follow. But once you grow, you need other people to help you. If you don't have those other people, then you're going to start to struggle with your accountability and you're going to start to struggle in a lot of ways. So then you empower others. What happens when you empower others? You go back to self-awareness because now you have this new burden, <laughs> this new challenge of leading people. And so then you got to become more self-aware and then the cycle continues from there. I want to focus on that last because I think a lot of people struggle with how do you empower other people? Yeah. Um, I've worked a lot in churches and... I think one of the downfalls that the church has is leaders have a hard time empowering other people. And so you end up not, I, I like that to work yourself out of a job, <laughs> but if we yeah. don't empower people, we don't do that well. So give me an example of how you, what, what steps you have for empowering other people. Yeah. So I teach my clients a five-step process and uh, I have those steps in my right now leadership book, but since writing that book, I've had an even deeper dive into it, like even more realizations from it. So the, the steps are we have to expect and then study, listen, then, then create that accountability and then celebrate. So the, so I'm going to dive into each of them. But the, fir the first one is expect. So Keith, what was the last really good movie or TV show that you watched? Wow, that's a good one. Um <laughs> It's hard to find good movies today. I'm trying to think what it was. Yeah, it's true. I did. I, I, <laughs> so many of them are bad. Um, I can't think of one offhand. Do you have a, a, a old favorite or a, a TV show favorite or a book favorite or anything like that? I do have a. I do have an old favorite. But one of my old favorites is because it's the Christmas season. Is I love it's a wonderful life. Okay, cool. So when you watch a wonderful life, do you find yourself? fussing around with your phone or doing something on the computer or having a conversation with people over here? In other words, do you find yourself really distracted? Not typically, no. No. So you're engaged in that movie. So for some people, maybe you instantly came, something came to mind for a great movie or a great TV show you recently watched. We're at the edge of our seat, right? We're expecting the movie to be great. Otherwise, we're we don't want to watch it or we don't want to read it if it's not going to be great. And if it isn't great, then we kind of move on. But right. here's, the, here's the deal about empowering people. We need to start with the expectation that they are amazing, that they are beautiful, they're wonderfully made, right? And that they have fascinating and amazing insights to share their skills, their talents, whatever they are, whatever they have is amazing and it's and expecting that to be true. So when we do that, we're setting our unconscious mind to a different angle. Um, one of the things that I've been teaching lately is that Every, every second, there's 2 million bits of information your brain has to filter. And if you picture those 
bits of information are like little toothpicks and those p toothpicks have something written on them. Two million toothpicks fit in, in a fr refrigerator. So picture your refrigerator dumping two mi million toothpicks on you every second. You can't take them all in. It's not possible, right? So, so the way it works is you're grabbing some of that information. And for most people, it's around 126 bits. So you grab that and, you, and that's the information we take in. So if I decide up front that this employee that, I'm, that I've hired or this person that I'm leading or this uh, kid that I have is a jerk, annoying, frustrating, whatever, every time 2 million bits of information come at me every second, I'm going to grab the ones that prove me to be right. Prove, me, prove to me that that employee is annoying, that that child is frustrating, that this situation sucks, whatever. Or when you start with an expectation of excellence, I'm going to grab 126 bits that prove that to be true. And then that's going to rub off or, or play forward into those people's lives. So that is foundational. And you, you got to start there with that expectation. And sometimes you can write it down. Sometimes we can pray about it. Sometimes we can have conversations, but regardless, start there. Second, you study. So step, step two is study, not books. I see you have a, awesome books behind you, fantastic numbers of books, and I'm sure you've read a, all of them or most of them, but I'm talking about studying people. How do they, how do they communicate? Do they, are they inferential, inferential speaker or listener? Are they a literal speaker or listener? Are they more visual? Are they more auditory, kinesthetic? Where are they on the disc or the Myers-Briggs spectrum? What do I know about this person so I can understand them better? So I can do the third step, which is to be able to listen to them and ask great questions. And great questions is the heart of it. So if the foundation is expectations, uh, high expectations, the heart of it is great questions. And those questions are open questions. So a quick story, I'm working with this lady that runs a couple private schools. And when we first started a couple years ago, she had bad employees or some, some of them were bad employees. And she was having a hard time with taking on way too much. She was becoming the bottleneck, didn't have a lot of clarity on goals, all that kind of stuff. Well, over the course of time, we started to develop some strategies, get, get, things in place, get her business in a better position, get rid of some of the bad apples, bring in some good apples when it comes to teachers, no pun intended. Um, and then she still was getting a little bit hung up on things. And it turned out that she wasn't doing a great job of asking open-ended questions. So I suggested to her a forward question, which is simply, instead of being Wonder Woman, when someone comes in the room and solving all the problems or Superman and solving all the problems, just when they bring you a problem, ask a forward question, which is, what do you think? That's it. And then you shut up <laughs> and you listen. You just stand there or sit there and listen. And she told me a story a couple months ago. Teacher came in, brought this convoluted issue with a parent to her. And, and so my client said, well, what do you think? That was it. She said those four words. And then the teacher, blah, 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 oh, blah, 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 blah. She's talking to herself while my client's right. sitting there at her <laughs> desk. Five, 10 minutes later, the teacher's like, thank you. You're such a good listen listener. I really appreciate it. Walked out with a solution. My client said nothing but that forward question. And get this, she's from New York. She's a dominant style personality in the disc spectrum, which is aggressive, assertive, gets right to the point but she's learned how to just ask questions. So once you do that, once you've studied them, ask questions, then it's easy to keep them accountable because they've come up with the solutions. So ultimately they're keeping themselves accountable and that's all we can really do anyway. I can't hold you accountable, Keith, and you can't hold me accountable. We can support each other, but ultimately it's up to me to stay accountable. And so when I make the decision as the employee, it's more likely that I'm gonna fall through. Lastly, we celebrate. We celebrate the successes and the setbacks. And it's really important to celebrate the setbacks because when Susie comes in and comes up with a solution and then the solution doesn't work out, if we knock her down because of that, she won't continue to come to you with solutions. She's going to come to you and farm out her thinking. And you're going to have to come up with the solutions, which isn't what we want. So we celebrate the effort and the person. Not, and we also celebrate the effort and the person in the setback too. It's not about the result ultimately, and to really build people up and empower them. It's not about the results, it's about the effort they put in and how they went about it. So long, long story short, those are the five, five components. They just need some explanation. Otherwise it's, it's too, too little to understand. Sure. No, I love that. And I love your story because 
I I am a high D or was a high D. Um, I think what you did kind of was helping that high D person become a higher I because now you're not there trying to solve everybody's problem, but you're now influencing them to make choices for themselves. And I've actually shifted more to where I'm an I. So I don't try to solve everybody's problems. I, I could do, I ask good questions. And so now they begin to solve their problems and I can sit back and watch them solve their problems, celebrate with them as they solve those problems or support them. Like you said, when those problems don't get solved and say, okay, well that didn't work. What else could you think of? Try. Yep. Exactly. And it's, it's actually <laughs> such a less, uh, a lesser burden that the leader has to carry. And, and it's not abdicating. It's, it's actually being really responsible and giving people the opportunity to do what you hired them to do, which is to make decisions. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> that's why we hired these people, or at least I hope so. They're not robots. AI hasn't made it that far yet. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So let's circle back because you talk about empowering us, but let's get back to the first part of your, your B, which is becoming self-aware. So what are some steps to help a person who's just starting out to become more self-aware? Yeah, I have a client that I'm working with right now that had this extremely powerful breakthrough for him. He, he wrote me an email, uh, to, I think it was the day before Christmas, and it was about how grateful who he was for the things, the support that I've given, the coaching and how his life has changed so much. And I didn't, like, I knew I was helping him, but I didn't realize how much until he wrote that, that letter. And so that was really encouraging to me. But the point of sharing with that with you is one of the more recent exercises we've done is, is establishing his values for his career. Now I know people talk about, you know, know your values, blah, blah, blah. Great. I totally agree. But this method is, is unique and different because it's, it's establishing your values from an unconscious place. Because if you were to ask me, what are my values? I would tell you like excellence, family, these, this list, learning, et cetera. I mean, I have them up on my wall <laughs> right here. But the first things that come to mind are, are only surface level values. And when I'm working with people, we get into the unconscious levels. Like what motivated you when you were the most motivated in your career? What was the feeling behind that? And when you think about that, you're like, what was the feeling behind that? Well, whatever that feeling is, that's a value, right? And when you think about all these things being present in your life, all these values, if there is, if, if you had all those, would you still stay in your career? Yes or no. And some people say they would, and some people say they don't. Well, what would you need to stay in your career path? Or if you choose a different area of life, what would you need to, to continue down your path in your family relationships or whatever it is? And that answer is a really deep unconscious layer of what motivates you and values are a filter. And so the more clearly, you know, your filters in life, the more clearly you're going to know yourself and whether the decision you want to make is the right one, because it's a deep layered filter of who you are. And when they're not, when values aren't lined up, that's where you have internal conflict. And so if I, if I'm all about, you know, gratitude and then I'm all about uh, service, but I don't have, a, but I feel like there's a conflict between service and gratitude because I'm, I'm not very happy about the fact that when I serve people, there's not much that comes back to me. There's a conflict there and there's some baggage I need to deal with. And that's wonderful to know. But if I didn't know my values at a deeper unconscious level, that wouldn't have been dredged up. So it's very important to, you don't have to start with values, but it's really important to at some point get there. We, we talk about leading with accountability, um, which I don't see a lot of in the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. what, does that look, what does that look like for those who, who want that to be part of their business or part of their life? Well, I want to first highlight that you just made like the understatement of, of the year. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people don't lead with accountability. Um, I'm guessing that you and I and your listeners aren't in that boat. We are on the boat right. that we do lead with accountability. <laughs> and so this will ring true and make a lot of sense. Uh, in my book, I talk about a four-step process, and I'll, I'll make sure this is shorter than the five-step process, but um, <laughs> the, I call it the accountability pass. And uh, Keith, when you think of 2024, what is what is the big, hairy, audacious goal, the big goal you want to accomplish in 2024? For me, it's finishing up my doctorate. I'm, I'm at the oh, awesome. very tail end of it. And so I... <laughs> I really want to get that done in 2024. Awesome. Okay. So what is the reason or the purpose behind completing that doctorate? 
You know, for me, I always love, I love learning. I love learning new things. I love taking notes and being able to apply those to what I do. So for me, it's an opportunity to, to add more things to my tool chest of knowledge and research is a big piece I never did before. So for me, I'm looking forward to be able to implement that and helping organizations learn how to manage change. That's what my doctorate said. Okay. So helping organizations manage change is the purpose, but one of the purposes behind this goal. So in the first letter of the accountability pass, it's passive, passive accountability. And it's the idea that you're sharing with the listeners on the show, you're sharing with friends, family, acquaintances, that's your goal, that you're going to get this PhD to help organizations make changes. That's a big deal. That's important. <laughs> you know. And so some of the people that you tell are going to be interested. It's around 10%. Let's say you tell 30 people, three people will actually care. Let's just be honest. Most yeah. people don't care or don't remember. <laughs> So three of them will care. And some of those will follow up with you and say, Hey, how's it going with your PhD? How, what's, how's the studying going? What's your, what do you have as your, as your, is it, it's a dissertation, right? Right. Yeah. So what's going on with your dissertation, whatever. Right. So now they're keeping you passively accountable because you know, they're going to ask you about it. Then you choose one of them and you say, Hey, Tony, would it be cool if we connect on a weekly basis to talk about the goals you're trying to achieve and the goals I'm trying to achieve and just bounce ideas off each other and, and keep each other accountable? Tony's going to say, heck yeah, I've been looking for someone like that because most people don't have someone like that. So that's the A, which is active accountability. And then the first S is stuff or structures. So the structures would be your to-do list and your calendar. And this is really simple, but we need it in place. The, the calendar is the people that's going to help you accomplish your goals. And then the to-do list are the things that are going to help you accomplish your goals. Now there is some intermixing, but for the most part, it's the people and the things, uh, calendar and to-do list. And then the last S is um, self accountability. So have you ever zip lined or skydived or bungee jump before Keith? Anything that involves jumping off a height thing? No. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll assume that people understand one of those three concepts and I'm going to, I'm going to stick with the zip lining because that's the most common thing people could have done in their life. So when, when my wife and I had our, our honeymoon a long time ago, now we went to Costa Rica and we did this zip line where uh, my wife actually decided that on the thousand foot zip line, that's above the tree canopy where you're, you're zipping along for a thousand feet that she was going to strap herself to the dude and hang underneath him while they slid across the canopy. And then they asked me if I wanted to do that. And I said, no, that's okay. I think I'll just go, go by myself. Um, but the thing about that is when I went off the platform and when she especially went off the platform, there was no turning back. She was committed. You can't crawl back up that zip line. It's not going to happen. You are going down, period. And it's the same thing with our self-accountability. We have to find that point of no return. Once you, get on, once you step off that platform, once you lean into it, it's over. You're not getting back to that old way. And if you want to have great accountability, this is, this is the personal part of it that's so important to do. So for me and my business, it, it was my wife quitting her nursing job. You know, that, that was the point of no return for us as a family. And I don't know what it is for anybody else when you're thinking about your goal, Keith, or anybody else's, but whatever that is, that will help you stay accountable to following through. Yeah. When I wrote my first book, I had people I set up as my accountability partners yeah. and they all had different roles. One of them, I said, I just need you to pray for me. Um, I don't, I don't, I know you're going to do it. I don't have to check in and make sure you're doing it. I just need you to do that. Then I had someone who was going to be the encourager because there's going to be points in time that I knew where it got too difficult and I'm just going to want to quit. Um, I need someone just kind of pat me on the back and go, you can do this. And then I had the kick in the pants person who I needed someone just like the, the encouragement thing isn't working. I need someone just to kick me really hard to make sure I keep going. And, and it worked because all those people at some point served an important role in that process. And the same thing happened with my dissertation. I need these people in my life to do certain things. And I, I call them and say, hey, I need you to do this. And they've been there. So it's been really kind of cool. That's awesome. I mean, you followed the process. And, right. And that's awesome. <laughs> Love it. So we got one more. And I'm going to give you, give us the name of your book too. I forgot, forgot to do that. But the growth mindset. Tell us about the growth mindset. Yeah, the growth mindset is one of those weird ones. When I wrote that section, it was kind of hard for me to to write because in my mind, it's just a out 
output, I guess you could say an output of being self-aware and being accountable. And it is, it, it really is. Uh, but so then I came up with a metaphor in the book that, that I called the growth SUV. And even to this day, I still kind of have a hard time remembering each, each component of it. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and look, but uh, the, the first, the way that I describe it is it's one of those SUVs that four wheel drive or all wheel drive that it, it's real smooth on the road no problem on the streets or whatever, but then it can get on the dirt road. It can get on the muddy road and it can get on the rocky road. And this is, this is growth for us. We go through those experiences and in the growth SUV, there's five different mindsets. And the first one is in the back left, sitting, sitting by the window, kicking its feet on the seat, annoying the crap out of the driver saying, let's go, let's do it. We can do it. And it's called the risk mindset. Right. So it sits back there kicking the driver and the driver. It's kind of hard for the driver to see it, but it knows it's there and it's getting annoyed by it. And every once in a while takes the risks and other times tells the, the risk mindset to shut up <laughs> because they're tired of getting the seat kicked. Uh, and then in the middle is is the learner mindset. So they're sitting in the middle with their feet up on a hump. I don't know if, if you know that comedic routine or not, but um, right in the middle. And so the driver can see them in the rear view mirror. Every time they look back, they get to see them in the mirror and they see what they learned from the risks that they took or not taking the risks or the experiences that they had. And the learner is always reminding us to continue learning regardless of the outcomes that we experience. And then the next one is the persistent mindset. So that's the right side. And so they're whispering across the way to the driver saying, hey, keep going, keep going. This is kind of hard. I know we're taking a risk here, but you're learning from it. Keep going, keep going. You got this. We can, we're going to persist without exception to quote Andy Andrews. And then the fourth is in the, in the um, shotgun. And that is, I'm sorry, the fourth is in, yeah, the fourth is in shotgun and that's the sales mindset. And it, it sits there going, let's do this. It's not about risk. It's about we can do anything and they're going to influence and pitch that mindset inside of us is going to be pitching and, and trying to encourage you and move you forward. We, we can do anything. Let's go for it. Always having the ideas and trying to move you forward with the ideas. And then finally, in the driver's seat, uh, the mindset of abundance, because it doesn't matter how good of a salesman you are, how, how much risk you take. If you don't have an abundant mindset, it's going to be difficult to even lean into those other mindsets. Because if I fail and I don't have abundance, I'm not going to learn from it. If I'm experiencing the push of risk, if I don't have an abundant mindset, I don't think it's going to work out to take the risk, right? And so on and so forth. So those mindsets combine together to create a forward momentum and growth in our lives. And they can handle any circumstances. So give us a title of your book and where can I find it? Yep. It's uh, Right Now Leadership, a four-part framework for today's leader. And you can find it on Amazon. I think it's bookstorenow.com, uh, Barnes & Noble, just any any of those retailers. And then also on my website, uh, blueshirtcoaching.com slash book is, is there as well. Great. I love to ask my guests this question. What do you want your legacy to be? Yeah, my legacy. You know, I actually have that a little bit written out. So let me see if I can conjure it. Uh, in my mind, uh, for me, my legacy is is about my kids having a bigger impact than I get to have, right? But it's also about the impact that I'm making on uh, the clients that I have impacting the people that they work with, right? So for me, transforming thousands of business owners means I'm transforming tens of thousands of business owners' lives or uh, people's lives. Because in my experience growing up in a small business context, my dad's had hundreds of employees over the course of his his career and usually 50 or 60 at a time. And he's helped those people raise a family, send their kids to college and be an example to them, a solid, high integrity, high accountability example for decades. That's what I want to be able to do as I'm helping my clients get to a better place that's going to impact generations going forward. And if they're in a bad place, especially as men, broken men break things. And so if I can help these men that are feeling a little broken, like everyone does, men and women, and help them get to a better place, we're not going to be breaking things. Maybe at all, right? When we get to that transformational spot, and that makes a difference. That's a legacy shifting experience for people and families and generations. So for me, that's a... a um, a big motivator for doing what I do. That's awesome. Anything I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Uh, no, I, 
no, we're good. I, I love the interview. I really appreciate it, Keith. Great questions. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, great. If you had one message to tell a young entrepreneur, what would that be? Ask questions like crazy. And, and when I say questions, I don't mean how do you do ABC more? Who are you and what are you about? Learn people's stories. That stories are amazing and it endears you to other people and grows your network. But most importantly, you just, there's so much wisdom in people's stories. So ask the stories of people's experiences, why they do what they do. Great. So Kyle, where can my listeners find you on social media? Yeah. Anywhere on social, if you type in uh, blue shirt coaching, you'll find me Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, and then go to blueshirtcoaching.com to connect with me directly, set up a free conversation or learn more about what I do on there as well. Well, thanks for your, you, you investing in the lives of young entrepreneurs, young business people, because like you said, as you impact the leader, you impact thousands of those who follow the leader. So thank you for what you do and, and blessings on the sale of your book. May people pick it up and please leave with accountability <laughs> would, be, would be my goal. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it. You have a blessed new year.